Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this second part of the video, we're going to look at how to graph rational functions. So, graphing rational functions. We've seen how to find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes from the previous video. We've also looked at how to find um, important features about what's happening near a vertical asymptote. So now we're going to use this strategy on how to graph a rational function where a rational function is of this form, f of x equals p of x divided by q of x, and p of x and q of x are polynomial functions, but they have no common factors. So if there is a common factor, make sure you cancel the common factor first and then graph the rational function. So the first thing you can do, you can look to see if there's any symmetry, which is not very often, but you can replace x with negative x, Simplify the function, and if the function stays the same, the function, the graph will have y-axis symmetry. And if you replace x with negative x, and it turns out to be the opposite of the original function, then the graph has origin symmetry. But like I said, that doesn't happen that often. You can find the y-intercept, if there is one, by replacing x with 0 in the function. So I said if there is one, because what if the y-axis is a vertical asymptote? then you cannot touch or cross the y-axis. So there will not be a y-intercept then. Number three, you can find the x-intercepts, again, if there are any, by solving the equation p of x equals zero. p of x was the numerator of the rational function. So you can set the numerator equal to zero and find the x-intercepts. Number four, find any vertical asymptotes, and there could be more than one, by solving the polynomial equation q of x equals zero. q of x was the denominator. So once the function's in lowest terms, take the denominator, set equal to zero, and then solve for x, and those turn out to be the vertical asymptotes. Once you have the vertical asymptotes, find the horizontal asymptote. Again, if there is one, because we had three different guidelines, we can use the rules for determining horizontal asymptotes by using the degree of the numerator and degree of the denominator. Number six, plot at least one point between any two x-intercepts, between or beyond x-intercepts, and vertical asymptotes. So that just gives you some accuracy in your graph. It gives you an idea of, does your graph exist above or below the x-axis between two x-intercepts or between two vertical asymptotes or between a x-intercept and a vertical asymptote? And then once you have that step finished, you're ready to graph. So step seven, use the information obtained previously and then graph the function. Make sure that you include all your x-intercepts, the y-intercept, and asymptotes. So example four, graph an irrational function, and we're going to go through each of these six steps before we get to the last step, which is graphing. So number one, we're going to graph f of x equals three x subtract three divided by x minus two. This is a rational function. It's a division of two different polynomials. So the first step we're going to do is determine the domain. So we've looked at this in the previous video. The domain is determined by taking the denominator and it cannot be zero. So notice that x cannot equal two. So write the domain using interval notation. Negative infinity to two and then union 2 to infinity. Parentheses on 2. You do not want to include x equals 2. All right, so step one's finished. Number two, simplify the rational function to lowest terms, if possible, so it might already be in lowest terms, so that you can find the vertical asymptotes. So simplify the rational function, if possible.
All right, so we have 3x subtract 3, and that is divided by x subtract 2. The only thing I notice is that there's a 3 in common in the numerator, so that can be factored out. And the denominator cannot be factored at all. And notice that there are no common factors in the numerator or denominator, so this function is in lowest terms. Okay, so how does that help? Well, after the function's in lowest terms, the guideline said you can find vertical asymptotes by taking the denominator and setting it equal to zero. So that means x subtract 2 equals 0 means x equals 2. That must be a vertical asymptote. Keep in mind that vertical asymptotes are not actually part of the graph. So this will be denoted with a dashed line for the vertical asymptote. So there is a connection between the domain and the asymptote. We cannot have x equals 2 plugged into the function to give us a y value because it's a vertical asymptote. All right, so that's the second step. Third step, find any intercepts. Find any x-intercepts and y-intercept, if there is any. So these are key points on your graph. If you can find any, that will give you some more accuracy when you graph. So the x-intercepts, from the guidelines, the strategy that was a, before this example, it said you find your x-intercepts by making the y value 0, which is the same as finding out what x values will make the numerator 0. All right, so the numerator was 3x attract 3. If that's equal to 0, then you find out that x equals 1. So there's an x-intercept at 1, 0. So the graph might touch the x-axis and turn around, or it might cross the x-axis. That's going to come in later. The y-intercept, the y-intercept is found by substituting x equals 0 into the function. So if we do that, we'll have 3 times 0, subtract 3, divided by x. Uh, 0 subtract 2. So the y value will be 3 divided by 2, positive. So in other words, 1.5, 0 comma 3 halves. So we do have one x-intercept and one y-intercept. Analyze the behavior of the graph near each x-intercept and vertical asymptote. So this is one of the most important steps before we graph. Okay, what this means is that we're going to find out, does the graph go up when you hit a, when you hit a vertical asymptote on the left side or the right side, or does the graph go down when you get closer and closer to a vertical asymptote on either side? And at the x-intercepts, does the graph cross the x-axis, or does it touch and turn around? So we're going to make a sign chart. Okay, a sign chart is essentially just a number line. where the number line represents all x values. And we had two very important x values come up so far. We've had x equals 2, which was a vertical asymptote. And we had x equals 1, which was an x-intercept. So plot those on the number line, 1 and 2. Make sure they're in numerical order going from left to right. That's important. And now notice that this x equals 1 and x equals 2 divides the number line up into 1, 2, and 3 different sub-intervals. So now what we're going to do is find what's called test values. We get to choose these. These are ours. So that we can choose any x value to the left of x equals 1. How about 0? 0 is to the left of x equals 1. How about an x value between 1 and 2? 1.5. I'm just choosing some that are going to be nice and easy to substitute in for x. And how about x equals 3? You could choose x equals 7 if you wanted to, as long as it's a value greater than 2 for that interval. 
All right, now what do you do with these test values? We want to find out is the graph above or below the x-axis on each of these three subintervals. So substitute the values into the original function. We're going to find out what the y values are. So at 0, if you substitute 0 in, we just did that. That's the y-intercept. So 3 halves, it's positive 3 halves. So how do you denote that on the number line? A little plus. Plus just means you're a, the graph is above the x-axis. So on, your, on the left side of x equals 1, the graph is above the x-axis. 1.5. If you substitute in 1.5 into the function, negative 3. So this time the y value is negative, so a little minus. That means the graph is now below the x-axis. So x equals 1 was an x-intercept. It was a point on the x-axis. So that means the graph goes above the x-axis to below. So it crosses at x equals 1. So this is what it means by analyzing the behavior. The graph will cross at x equals 1. And now we have one more test value. If you substitute in x equals 3, you'll get y equals 6. And that is positive 6. And that means the graph is now back to being above the x-axis. So what does this mean? It means, keep in mind, x equals 2 was a vertical asymptote. And we're going to use a dashed line for it. On the left side of the vertical asymptote, it can either go up, it can grow indefinitely without bound, or it can decrease without bound on the left side. If you're below the x-axis, then the graph goes down. It decreases without bound. On the right side of the vertical asymptote, the graph is above the x-axis. So that means the graph is increasing on the right side without bound. So that's how you analyze the behavior when you're close to a vertical asymptote the graph might be going opposite directions, like it is here. Okay, so then we are above the x-axis on the interval, negative infinity, until we get to x equals 1, which was the x-intercept. And then we're also above the x-axis from the vertical asymptote, x equals 2, to infinity. And we're below the x-axis, between the x-intercept and the vertical asymptote, so 1 to 2. Okay, so this is the fourth step. Like I said, this is the most important step. It is to make a sign chart for f of x to find out if the graph is above or below the x-axis. All right, now step five. Find the horizontal asymptote if there is any. So let's go back to the original function. f of x was 3x minus 3 divided by x subtract 2. So remember how you find horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes only are important at the far right end of the graph or the far left end of the graph. So you want to compare the degree of the numerator, the denominator. The degree of the numerator is 1 for that polynomial, and the degree of the denominator is also 1. If the degrees are equal in the numerator and denominator, then the horizontal asymptote is the fraction or ratio of the leading coefficients. And it's always y equals 4 horizontal asymptotes. Looks like the leading coefficients are 3 in the numerator and 1 in the denominator. So it's this ratio, or just 3. So this means as you go to the far left end and the far right end, the graph will get close to the line y equals 3. All right, and now we're ready to graph. So we're going to make a sketch of the graph, make sure that all the x-intercepts and the y-intercept are included, and any vertical asymptotes are also included, but the asymptotes vertical and horizontal asymptotes are dashed lines. Alright, let's start with our points. 
x equals 1 was an x-intercept. So there's a point, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we had a y-intercept at 0, 1.5, or 3 halves. So there's a point. Make sure you label your points as well. So this was 0, 3 halves, y-intercept. We had a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. So this is a dashed line representing this vertical asymptote. Make sure you label it as well. Vertical asymptote, x equals 2. And then there is a horizontal asymptote, y equals 3. So the graph will get close to this horizontal line at the far ends of the graph. Alright, so this doesn't seem like we have that much. Now let's go back to the sign chart or the number line we found some points that we can actually plot because we found the y values. We found the y value when x equals 0. It was 3 halves. Got it. We substitute in x equals 1.5 and the y value was negative 3. So that is also a point. 1.5, negative 3. It's not an x-intercept or y-intercept. It's just a point on the graph. And then at x equals 3, we had y equals 6. So 3 comma 6 would be right there. Notice that your points are in the bottom left corner of the asymptotes, and this point is in the top right corner. So if you remember back to the basic rational function graphs, it looks like this is going to be in the bottom left corner of the asymptotes and the top right corner. Alright, so let's graph. At the far left end, the graph will level out towards y equals 3. It'll get really close to the horizontal asymptote. But then as you go to the right, the graph will go down and pass through the y-intercept, the x-intercept, and also this 1.5 comma negative 3. Now, notice that the closer you get to the vertical asymptote on the left side, we said the graph was going to decrease without bound, and it does. And now, on the other side of the vertical asymptote, it was increasing without bound. And then the graph must pass through 3, 6. And the graph must get close to the horizontal asymptote as you go to the right. So the graph will come down, pass through the point, 3 comma 6, and then start to level out towards y equals 3. So this is what the graph of 3x subtract 3 divided by x subtract 2 looks like. And it has all the features that we found. x-intercepts, y-intercept, asymptotes, and also points we obtained from the sign charts or the number line. Okay, let's try a different problem. Number 2. This time we're going to graph g of x, which is x squared plus 2x, subtract 8, and then that is divided by x squared, subtract 4. So it's not degree 1 divided by degree 1 polynomials. This is still a rational function, but it looks like it's degree 2 divided by degree 2. Two polynomials divided by one another. So it's still a rational function. All right, first step, start with the domain. The domain gives us information about where could any vertical asymptotes possibly be. So the domain, take the denominator, it cannot equal zero, because we would be divided by zero then. That's not going to give us a real number. Factor the, the denominator, if it's possible, and this one is a difference of squares. So x cannot be 2, and x cannot be negative 2. So, writing the domain using interval notation, it would be negative infinity to negative 2. That one would, would occur first. 
then the x values between negative 2 and 2 are fine, and then 2 to infinity. Those are the x values that would give you a y value back from plugging it into the function. Okay, so that's step one. First step is domain. Second step, find any vertical asymptotes by simplifying the function to lowest terms. So simplify the function to lowest terms, if possible. Alright, so go back to the original function, g of x, x squared plus 2x subtract 8, and divide by x squared subtract 4. Well, we already know the denominator factors from the domain, x plus 2, x minus 2. The numerator also factors. It's a trinomial, so two factors that multiply to negative 8, and two factors, the same two factors, need to add a 2 x plus 4 and x subtract 2. So I notice that there is a common factor, x minus 2 and x minus 2. So x plus 4 divided by x plus 2, that is simplified. So if the function is simplified, whatever the denominator is set equal to 0 and solved for x, these are vertical asymptotes. So it looks like x equals negative 2 is the only vertical asymptote for the function. All right, so after you find the vertical asymptote, now let's find the x and y intercept if there are any. So find the intercepts, find the x intercepts and y intercept. Okay, x-intercepts, we make the y value 0. It doesn't matter if you, if you use the one that the function that's simplified or the original, it does not matter. If you use the original function and substitute in um, and you make the whole function equal 0, Keep in mind, that means the numerator must be equal to 0 to find x-intercepts. So x squared plus 2x minus 8 equals 0. And we know that factors as x plus 4 and x minus 2 equals 0. And so it looks like x equals negative 4 or x equals 2. But remember, x equals 2 was not in the domain. So that's not an x-intercept, just x equals negative 4. So negative 4, comma 0. That's the x-intercept, the only one. Now let's find the y-intercept, if there is any. y-intercept, make the x value 0. And that would be, it's a, the function's g of 0. So that would be um, 0 squared plus 2 times 0, subtract 8, divided by 0 squared, subtract 4, and this will be 2. So 0 comma 2 is the y-intercept. Okay, so once you have the intercepts, now we're ready to construct a sign chart, or a number line again. Alright, so now we're ready to create a sign chart. Keep in mind, the sign chart is just a number line that represents all possible x values. So in the sign chart, make a number line. Now, what goes on the sign chart? You have all your x-intercepts and your vertical asymptote. So negative 4 was the x-intercept. So that's going to be a, gr a point on the x-axis. And then the other x value that came up was x equals negative 2 was a vertical asymptote. So notice that these x the x-intercept and the vertical asymptote divide the number line up into three regions again. So I'm going to choose to the left side of negative 4. How about x equals negative 5? Between negative 4 and negative 2, negative 3. And then greater than negative 2, how about x equals 0? If you can choose x equals 0, 
do so, because it's one of the easiest values you can substitute into the function. So these are called test values, and these values go into the original function to find out what the y value is. Is the y value positive or negative on each of these three intervals? So negative 5. If you substitute negative 5 in, you'll find out that the y value is 1 third. So that is positive above the x-axis at x equals negative 3 you'll find out the y value is negative 1 so now the y values become negative between negative 4 and negative 2 the graph is below the x-axis and then we've already found what the y value is at x equals 0 it was um, 2 so above the x-axis again So what does this mean in terms of the, the behavior of the graph? Because the fourth step was to analyze the behavior of the function near the x-intercept and the vertical asymptote using a sign chart. All right, analyze the, the behavior. The graph is above the x-axis on the left side of negative 4 and then below on the right side of negative 4. So it has to cross at x equals negative 4 to be above and then on the other side to be below. On the vertical asymptote, on the left side of the vertical asymptote we're below the x-axis so that the graph will decrease without bound. And on the right side of the vertical asymptote we're above the x-axis so the graph increases without bound. So we have an idea of what's happening at the x-intercept and the vertical asymptote. So now the last step before graphing is find the horizontal asymptotes, if there are any. So go back to the original function, x squared plus 2x, subtract 8, divided by x squared, subtract 4, and notice that the degree of the numerator is 2. Same thing for the degree of the denominator. So if the degrees are the same, then the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the leading coefficients. So the horizontal asymptote looks like it's y equals 1 divided by 1, or y equals 1. So the leading coefficients are 1 and 1. Okay, so we have all the information we need. Let's make a sketch. So start by plotting your x-intercept and your vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptote and y-intercept. So we had a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. So that is a dashed line. It's not part of the graph. It just determines the shape of the graph x equals negative 2, vertical asymptote. And that was the only vertical asymptote. We had a horizontal asymptote, y equals 1. So at the far left and far right ends of the graph, the graph will get close to y equals 1. So let's make sure we label this. We had a x-intercept at x equals negative 4. So that's negative 4 comma 0. And there was a y-intercept at 0, 2. Okay, so again, this doesn't give us much information other than I already noticed that the point, negative 4, 0, that is in the bottom left corner of the asymptotes. And then the other point is 0, 2. It looks like it's in the top right corner of the, gra of the asymptotes. So those are where the graph's going to lie. Let's get a little bit more accuracy using the sign chart. At negative 5, the y value is 1 third. So negative 5, 1 third, so we're barely above the x-axis. 
at x equals negative 3, the y value is negative 1. So there's that point. And then at x equals 0, we just had before. It was y equals 2. So this gives me a little bit more information. So I know the graph will start from the left and get really close to y equals 1. The graph will come down through the three points that we have. The point negative 5, 1 third, it has to cross the x-axis at negative 4. As we found from the sign chart, it must pass through negative 3, negative 1. And then the closer we get to the vertical asymptote, we found out that the graph will decrease without bound. So the graph will go down like that. And then on the right side of the vertical asymptote, it, the graph is increasing without bound. So the graph will start up here on the right side of the vertical asymptote. And it has to pass through 0, 2, but then it must get really close to the horizontal asymptote over time. So the graph will come down, pass through the y-intercept, and then as you go to the right, the graph will level out towards the y equals 1 horizontal asymptote. So this is the graph of x squared um, plus 2x subtract 8 divided by x squared subtract 4. Now there's one more feature that we, of this graph that we haven't talked about yet. If you go back to the domain of the function, we found out that the domain was from negative infinity to negative 2, negative 2 to 2, but then 2 was omitted, but it was not a vertical asymptote. So we need to talk about what this means with the graph. There is no point at x equals 2. Because if you substitute in x equals 2, it is undefined. You'll be dividing by 0. So there's no vertical asymptote, but this is what's called a hole in the graph. So at x equals 2, there is no point there. It's a hole in the graph. So it's an open circle to omit the point. And this would be at x equals 2. And then to get the y value, you substitute into the original function, and it should be 2 squared plus 2 times 2, subtract 8, divided by 2 squared, subtract 4. So you'll have 0 divided by 0. That's why it's undefined. But if you use the simplified function that we had, it was simplified to be x plus 4 divided by x plus 2. So 2 plus 4 divided by 2 plus 2. That's coming from the simplified function. And this is 6 fourths, or 3 halves. So this is the point 2 comma 3 halves. Or should I say open point? It's not actually part of the graph. So like I said, this is called a hole in the graph. And that's because x equals 2 was not in the domain. So this gives you an idea of how to find the graph of a rational function with two different examples. Let's finish up the section with applications. So there's one application that involves rational functions. So there are several examples that involve asymptotic behavior that come up in the real world. So in other words, functions that are involving um, division by zero, possible. One of the particular applications comes from the business world where you are relating cost with average cost. And there is a difference between the two. The cost function we've seen before, C of X is the sum of the fixed and variable cost. And that's called the cost function. C of X is equal to fixed cost plus cost per unit times the number of units sold or manufactured. Now, how does this compare with average cost? Average cost per unit is if you produce x units, it's the sum of the variable 
and um, fixed cost, but then you divide by the number of units produced. How you can actually find the average cost function? The average cost function is denoted C bar of X. There's a bar or an overline on top of C, so this means average. So the average cost function is you take the cost function and you divide by X. So the last example, example five. Suppose that a company is manufacturing running shoes and their fixed monthly cost is $300,000 and it costs the company $30 to produce each pair of shoes. So part one, find the cost function, C of X, of producing X pairs of shoes. So this is not average cost, this is just talking about the cost function, which is fixed cost plus variable cost. The fixed cost is $300,000. Variable cost was $30 per pair, so 30x. So this is called the cost function. So we've seen that before. Part two, this is new. Find the average cost function, C bar of X, of producing X pairs of shoes. So C bar of X is average cost. It's cost divided by X. That would be 300,000 plus 30X. That's from the last part of the problem. And then divide by X. And this is called the average cost function. Now for the rest of the problem, we're going to be using the average cost function. So part three, find and interpret C bar of 1,000, so that's the average cost function, and C bar of 10,000. So C bar of 1,000. So the 1,000 refers to the number of pairs of shoes produced. So 1,000 pairs of shoes made. It was um, 300,000 plus 30 times 1,000 and then divide by 1,000 pairs of shoes. The numerator gives you the total cost of making 1,000 pairs of shoes. But if you divide by 1,000, then you find out the average cost per pair. So when you divide by 1,000, it is 330 per pair. So what does this mean? When 1,000 pairs of shoes are manufactured or made, the average cost per pair is $330 for the company to make. So this is extremely expensive for the company. If they make a thousand pairs of shoes, each pair on average costs $330. All right, so let's go to the next part. C bar of 10,000 pairs of shoes. So same idea, substitute this into the average cost function for the X, which is in the numerator and denominator. So this time when you divide, it turns out to be 60 per pair. So again, this means if 10,000 pairs of shoes are manufactured, the average cost per pair is $60. So it looks like if the company produces more pairs of shoes, their average cost will decrease. And that's going that's because it's offsetting the fixed cost. The monthly fixed cost was $300,000. They need to make several pairs of shoes to offset that fixed cost. And then this gets to the last part of the problem. 
Part 4. What is the horizontal asymptote for the graph of the average cost function? And then describe what this means for the company. So average cost, again, was 300,000 plus 30x divided by x. So keep in mind, if you want to find horizontal asymptotes for a rational function, and the average cost function is a rational function, you compare the degrees. Degree of the numerator is 1, and so is the degree of the denominator. It's also 1. So what is the horizontal asymptote? Right, it should be the ratio or the fraction of the leading coefficients. So it should be leading coefficient of the numerator is 30 and the leading coefficient of the denominator is 1. So 30 divided by 1 or just 30. What does this mean for the company? If the company manufactures more and more pairs of shoes indefinitely the average cost per pair will approach thirty dollars so no matter how many pairs of shoes the company makes the cost per pair will never be any lower than $30. So this finishes up the section on rational functions and graphing. If you have any questions about graphing rational functions or understanding the average cost function, please let me know. And if you have any questions while you work on the homework, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video.